All right, the vast majority of semiconductor devices don't rely on intrinsic semiconductors. They rely on extrinsic semiconductors. And that's because intrinsic semiconductors, first off, aren't very conductive. Um, and extrinsic semiconductors also allow us to control which type of carrier is present. Is it holes or it electrons that are present in greater population, right? So you can dope it to be either N-type or P-type. N-type means that it has extra electrons. And then p-type obviously means excess holes, okay? So how do we do that? Let's go back to our analogy for silicon. In silicon, we said that you ended up with an equal number, right? If you pulled out one electron, you ended up with that free electron and one hole. So they were equal in number. How are we going to change that here? Well, we have to dope silicon with another material. It can't be pure silicon. We have to add something else, something that has an extra electron, like phosphorus. If you look at the periodic table, you'll see that phosphorus is group five. It has one extra electron. So what would it look like if we swapped out one of these silicon atoms and we put in a phosphorus? So let's take this one here. And instead of silicon, let's imagine now that this one right there is a phosphorus. So what does that do to our electron count? Let's go ahead and add all our electrons like before. Now, when we get to our phosphorus, it has one, two, three, four, five, right? It actually has five electrons, right, instead of four. So this one electron is not involved in bonding, right? It's an extra. In fact, the phosphorus isn't super keen that it has that electron because it's extra, right? right? That extra electron, it technically needs it because the phosphorus has to have the same number of um, electrons as it does protons in its nucleus. And so if you took away this electron, you would now have a positively charged phosphorus, right? But uh, that's a small energy penalty. It's smaller than stealing something out of a bond. Stealing it out of a bond is a big energy penalty. Stealing it out of that and making it slightly charged donor of electron is pretty small. So if we pull that out, if we delocalize it, now this thing is delocalized. In doing so, what did we do? It is negatively charged but we made it so that this becomes positively charged. The phosphorus atom itself, since it lost an electron, it's now phosphorus 1 plus, right? So we made a charged donor impurity, okay? So the donor becomes slightly charged, okay? That is phosphorus. But you can see that because this isn't really held on very tightly, the energy necessary to strip it off is going to be small. So overall, for every single phosphorus atom impurity, you could end up with each one of those contributing one electron. So if you know how many phosphorus atoms you added to your silicon, you know how many extra electrons you have, right? So technically what we can also have happening is just like before, this electron right here can get liberated, right? And produce a delocalized electron and a hole, right? So it has the intrinsic contribution from before but it also has these extrinsic contributions. And we typically dope a material so that the extrinsic, we'll call this X intrinsic, is typically much greater than Ni, our intrinsic value. So that allows us to essentially ignore the contribution to electrical conductivity coming from our intrinsic uh, jumping across the band gap and only pay attention to the extrinsic values, right? So this is if we wanted extra electrons, right? By the way, why doesn't this hole move? Well, this hole is a site for the phosphorus atom, right? So it can't move to a silicon, right? Silicon doesn't have that spot. That's tied to this phosphorus atom, right? Because it is a group five instead of a group four atom. So before, previously, when we had a big electric field applied to this thing, we would have said that the hole would go this way, and the electron would go that way. That is not the case here. This time, only the electron moves. You don't get the hole contribution. Therefore, you really have made it excess electrons instead of equal number of electrons and holes. But you could dope it another way, right? If you so chose, let's start out with silicon like before. Okay, this time, instead of phosphorus, the atom that we're going to put here on this silicon site, let's put something like boron. If we put a boron atom there, what does it have? It only has three electrons. It's a group three element. So it has three electrons available for bonding. So one, two, three. That means that it has a built-in hole in this bond, right? It is not a satisfied electron. So that thing is just waiting to have an electron come fill that spot. Well, think about what happens. Let's say we take this electron right here, and it comes and it fills that spot, right? So now what has happened? When that happens, we end up with boron plus or boron minus, it's become a charged acceptor 
it has accepted an electron, and in doing so, what did it create? It created a hole for this nearby silicon, right? And now that hole is able to have another electron occupy it, and it can move, and then this one could come and occupy it, and then it could move. So in an electric field, right, if we have this electric field, so in an electric field, now this hole is able to move, right? So just like before, you can also have intrinsic things happening, right? You could also have this thing splitting and becoming a free electron and creating a hole down here. That's possible. That's your intrinsic contribution. But this time what we're assuming is that P, our extrinsic concentration, is going to be much greater than our intrinsic contribution. So up here, our n extrinsic is much greater than ni, and so we ignore ni. And here we have p, our number of holes is going to be much greater than ni, our intrinsic concentration, so we ignore it. Okay? So that is how you can dope things, and essentially it's just looking at the periodic table. If something's to the left of it, then it's going to be missing electron, it's going to dope it p-type. If it's to the right of it, it's going to have an extra electron, it's going to dope it n-type. Okay? So that is in extrinsic semiconductors. Um, my question is this. How would this weakly bound electron, or weakly, um, it, you know, with a little bit of energy, you could accept an electron and charge it? What does that look like from an energy diagram perspective? Let's draw this. So our diagrams looked like this before, right? We had our conduction band, and we had our valence band, and our Fermi level used to be right in the middle, right? How do we modify this picture to account for these dopants? What does that look like? Well, we know that it takes only a little bit of energy to take this electron and stick it to the boron and make the boron negatively charged. And it only takes a little bit of energy to steal this phosphorus electron's electron, phosphorus atom's electron, and take it away, making it a positively charged phosphorus plus, right? So what we need to do is have a small difference in energy. So what it looks like is this. For phosphorus, these are your states. You end up with electrons right here sitting in states, right? These can be promoted really easily. So those represent phosphorus dopants. And then down here you have an, a bunch of empty spots. These are empty available spots just willing to accept an electron. So an electron can come and it can hop up into that spot and create a hole here, whereas this one hopped up to create an electron here. So these would be our boron dopants. Okay, in that picture. So that is how energy diagrams can show you uh, what's going on here. Essentially, they're adding spots in the band gap where we normally don't have any spots for the intrinsic material. And in doing so, they allow us to delocalize at a really small energy penalty. Because think, the intrinsic penalty is to jump across that whole gap. That's a pretty big penalty. This gap, that's pretty small. This gap, that's pretty small. Therefore, that's why you're able to get n and p as being way larger than your intrinsic value. Okay. So again, for an n-type, we've already said this, that n-type, the number of electrons is going to be far larger than your intrinsic value and therefore larger than your holes. And that allows us to approximate our conductivity like that. Our conductivity is equal to the number of electrons times its charge times the mobility of our electrons. Technically, this should be modified. This should be plus Ni times the charge of an electron times the mobility of an electron plus the mobility of our holes, right? This term should technically be involved, but it's so much smaller than this first term because Ni is so much smaller that we just throw this out. We just ignore it, okay? And then the same thing for P-type. For P-type, you've doped it so it has lots of extra holes, so it's the exact opposite. You've got your conductivity is equal to the number of holes times the charge of a hole, which is just the charge of an electron, multiplied by the mobility of our holes, okay? So that is extrinsic semiconductors, which you can dope to be either p-type, meaning it has holes because you gave it an acceptor, or you can dope it n-type, where you have free electrons because you gave it a donor.